Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Anyways, uh, Jesus taught us to ask for our daily bread. Not our daily information or inspiration, but our daily bread. I think a lot of times in the church, we are very intent on delivering information or inspiration. Uh, we have gotten a little bit fancier. We think that people need to be happier, healthier, more successful, smarter, more motivated, just plain better. And if we're honest about it, a lot of the modern church maybe almost disdains simple, repeated, daily bread. Today we are gonna talk about why we do this. Uh, we call it communion typically here, but you can also call it the Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving or the Lord's Supper. Eating was important in Jesus' day. Uh, I can't really ever imagine a time when eating is not important and food is not popular. Um, and there are lots of different cultures and customs around food. You know the feeling if you're eating at someone's formal mahogany dinner table is different than if you just pull up to their kitchen counter or high top bar. I think about being in Japan, uh, typically, not always, always, but typically in Japan is considered rude to eat and walk at the same time. If you're gonna eat something, you pay attention to it, enjoy it, sit down at least, uh, don't just cram food into your mouth as you go to your next thing. I like it. I want to appreciate and enjoy my food. Uh, in Jesus' day, he would have eaten um, a little bit more like, uh, like this. They reclined at a table. And when I say Jesus and his disciples, I mean Jesus and his disciples, not me. Women, children, slaves did not eat like this. This is a position of leisure and luxury. Down on one elbow, then you eat with your right hand, which is why they always had to wash their hands. You know, not us, we have silver, we don't need to wash our hands as much. Um, but um, Jesus and his followers would have gathered like this, and eating like this is a custom that came in from the Greco-Roman world. And it says that you've got something worth lingering over. You actually, if it's just a crust of bread or something, you can just take that and uh, not sit back, put your feet up, relax over it. You've got food worth taking your time over. It gives lots of attention to other people. You do not eat super fast like this. It's very communal. And it's a position of security. If you're afraid that some dude from a neighboring warrior tribe is going to walk in the door with a knife, you, you don't relax like this. But it's a position of leisure and security. It is not to grab and go. And Jesus had some of his most significant interactions around a table just like this. I think of... Well, after he met uh, Levi, he actually met Levi uh, at his tax collector's booth. Levi was probably extorting money from some poor Israeli widow the, when Jesus saw him. And Jesus said, Levi, come, follow me, be my disciple. And so the first thing Levi did was he threw him a dinner party with Jesus as the guest of honor. Who did he invite to this dinner party? Well, his other terrible friends. Uh, and the scribes and religious leaders saw him and said, guys, why are you following this guy, Jesus? Do you not see who he is hanging out with? And Jesus said, even from his reclined position, I hear that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, it is the sick. I did not call, come to call people who have it all together, I came for those who need, know their need for me. But it wasn't just dinner. The morning after Jesus was raised from the dead, which his death and resurrection were pretty hard on his followers. Uh, Simon Peter thought he was going to handle it just fine. He did not. He denied Jesus three times with some swearing and some cursing, saying, I do not even know the man. The next day, Jesus shows up. 
He's gone back to his former day, day job fishing. Jesus shows up on the shore of the sea, makes breakfast for them, says, come, eat the breakfast I've prepared for you. Nobody really dares say anything. They just go, eat, wow, it's amazing. After they have finished their meal, eating together over the crumbs of breakfast, Jesus is like, Peter, Simon Peter, let's talk. Do you love me more than these? Yes, I love you, Peter says. Then take care of my lambs. He repeats it. Do you love me more than these? Yes, you know that I do. Feed my sheep. A third time, Jesus says, do you really love me? Now Peter's getting a little hurt because, you know, I mean, he knows he messed up, but yes, Lord, you know that I love you then take care of my sheep. And right there around the breakfast table with the crumbs uh, still out, Jesus tells them the truth. Jesus says, when you were younger, you did whatever you wanted. When you are older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will lead you where you do not want to go. He prophesies his future toward, to him and he reinstates him. He says, come Follow me. Eating was important in Jesus' day. Some of his most important ministry happened around this table. Uh, but the etiquette of eating, the rules around meals, was even more important in Jesus' day. Uh, I'm not talking about like putting your elbows on the table or talking with your mouth full like your mom criticizes you for. I'm talking about how Jesus eight, he really offended some people with how he ate, not how he ate specifically, who he ate with. One theologian said that Jesus was killed because of who he ate with. It wasn't the only reason, but it was a real reason. Jesus ate with people who he had no business eating with. And as they sat across the table from Jesus, they realized that they belonged there, that Jesus liked them, that Jesus wanted them, that their sins and failures were nothing compared with Jesus' love and forgiveness. They ate and drank their way into communion with Jesus. And we, too, can eat and drink our way into belonging with Jesus. All of us can eat. Can you put something in your mouth? Can you chew? Can you swallow? Hopefully, right? So can the biggest bully at your school. Maybe he eats a lot. Hopefully not your lunch. So can, so can your ex, your boss. So can the left-wing activist. So can the guy who posts long rants on Facebook. So can the little kid. So can the old man. All of us can eat. All of us can receive. And that's truly what Jesus cares about. So let's pray, and then we're going to see what we have to learn from Jesus' first communion. Let's pray. Jesus, we do today want to receive from you. Throughout our week, we do plenty that is producing and working. Today, we want to receive. And we clear away, Lord God, uh, all things that would inhibit us receiving, Lord God. We clear away distractions and we focus on you. If there is sin, uh, junk that's taking up space right now, friends, just name that. I ask for your forgiveness, Jesus. Would you clear that away, Lord God? And we fix our eyes on you, the one who has given us all things, all things. We repent for not believing that sometimes that you give us all things, that you have all good, every good for us in mind. Jesus, would we see you 
as our best friend. Father God, would, you see, would we see you as our loving Heavenly Father? Holy Spirit, would we see you as our guide into the fullness of life that you have for us today? Would you give us open hearts, open minds, open lives for your word today in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, we are going to be in Mark chapter 14. This is Jesus' last meal on earth. Um, you know, we have some traditions around last meals, very, very unfortunately, usually around like um, uh, very unfortunate reasons. But uh, this is what, how Jesus chose to spend his last meal on earth, and it was the Jewish festival holiday of Passover. He sent two of his disciples ahead to prepare the Passover meal. And in the evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Awkward. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one? Am I the one? How about me? He replied, it is the one of you 12 who is eating from this bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would have been far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. The word of the Lord. Amen. So communion and baptism are what we call in the church sacraments. Sacraments is a fancy word of saying it makes something visible, concrete, marks it on the calendar as a date, time, and place for something that is invisible. Uh, later on in the service, we will have a baptism. Uh, and baptism is kind of the sacrament of salvation, new life, forgiveness. Uh, now this water, while it can, you know, clean someone, um, this water is not what cleans us and forgives us. But it's a sign and a symbol of it. It's a very powerful symbol that's loaded with it because we do it following Jesus' commandments. And it gives us a time and place where we say, no, I am forgiven because I was baptized. It's so helpful to us. This is why Jesus commands us to do these things. It makes visible and concrete, which is something that is very, very real, but sometimes we need a little bit of help to see it in our own lives. Uh, we've started doing communion a tiny bit different. Uh, if you've been around for a number of years before COVID, we were doing communion and we pour it out into um, little cups. And uh, then during COVID, we changed how we were doing communion, like everybody changed how they were doing communion. And then after it says, well, we don't have to do it the exact same way. We did it like this once. It kind of stuck and worked, so we have continued. And really, there's no one right or wrong way to do communion. I mean, there's some wrong ways, but most of it involves here, me, inside, if I just you know, trot up knowing that I really don't believe or knowing that I've got big unfor unconfessed sins. So there's some wrong ways, but that's inside. Uh, if you've been to like a Catholic church taking communion there, you'll, you know, put your hands in the sign of a cross and then fold them into a throne. The cross becomes a throne. Really beautiful. So we, we don't do that here. What we do here is we're, we've started using a loaf of bread 
because it's big, it's real, it's substantial. Sometimes, actually, it's a little too real and substantial for me. I struggle uh, with it. But something that's got some substance to it, and we break it, as Jesus' body was broken apart for us, you will then take uh, a chunk, tear it. Jesus was tore apart for us, um, and dip it into the cup. Uh, we have you know, two, two cups here, but the cup is a symbol of unity. All of us are getting the same stuff from the same place. We also have uh, gluten-free uh, in the back. Um, we come up together as a symbol of unity, taking same stuff from the same place. All of us receive the same meal. There's not a kid's meal. There's also not an extra special, you know, reserved uh, meal. There are three uh, C's that I want to talk about today of what communion really is that help us appreciate and receive all that Jesus wants to give us in our daily bread. The first C is that this is a covenant meal. And a covenant meal is an ancient uh, practice that we see throughout redemption history that when you made a covenant, when you made a serious agreement with someone with a list of commitments, you killed an animal and ate it together. So, for example, if um, I make a commitment with one of you, I don't see very many of you who I want to make serious commitments, my daughter... She is in the back doing projection. Thank you, honey. If she and I, in a year from now, um, she gets her driver's license, we may make some commitments around that. I may say, I will let you drive my car, and you will promise to never text and drive, we'll fill up the gas tank, we'll pay for your insurance. We make some agreements. Then we would go to the temple, and in the presence of God kill an animal, eat that barbecued animal together, drink to seal the deal, it's ironclad. And that's why we do communion a little bit later in the service. So some of those agreements like confessing sin and being forgiven, hearing the word of God spoken, worshiping God, the back and forth is done and it celebrates and seals what's been done. Only people who are at peace with each other eat together. So like in Genesis, when Laban and Jacob finally come to a truce together, then they sit down and eat a meal. And we still do some of this if you've been part of a you know, big business merger acquisition. You sign the paperwork, and then you go out to celebrate with a meal. And you don't kill anything yourself, but maybe a cow died for your meal, or at least some nice grapes from France. The, com- the covenant meal we are celebrating in communion is based on the Passover meal. Passover is when Jewish folks celebrate back in their days of slavery uh, in Egypt as the final act of releasing them from the oppression of Pharaoh. Every Israelite family took a lamb, killed it, marked their home with the lamb's blood, and then had a meal celebrating this covenant with God. That Passover tradition uh, developed to include set prayers of thankfulness and praise called the Passover Haggadah, and Christian communion reenacts the Passover meal, not remembering a slain lamb, but Jesus' humble slaughter, not escape from Pharaoh, but escape from sin and death, and the historic liturgy of the church, um, especially in like Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran liturgy, is a direct development of the Passover, Haggadah, prayers of thankfulness and praise before eating the bread and wine to seal the deal. So communion is a covenant meal. It is also a celebration. Uh, who here has had a retirement or a graduation celebration recently? Thank you, thank you. Yes, um, I was just chatting with Andrea. She's going to have one uh, soon. Uh, she leaves many decades of long, hard work at her job. Uh, she's served well, served, just led teams really well, and she's going to step into a new season of life. Um, 
doing a second, third, fourth, doing a new degree, doing a new degree. So you close one chapter, you start another. Evan, you're, you're going to have a uh, celebration coming up soon. Uh, Evan has worked hard, um, studied well, even homeschooled. He worked hard at home, and for that, he gets the reward of leaving home. Um, <laughs> your birthday remember something a long time ago that we would never remember all, all by ourselves, something we cannot remember all by ourselves, something we maybe do not want to remember uh, is a little uh, uncomfortable and weird. It looks back at something you have to be reminded about, your birth, but it also looks forward to the next year. Your 16th birthday is not just about successfully completing 15, it's about what's going to happen at 16. New Year's, looks back and forwards your anniversary. Celebrations are backwards and forwards. And the Lord's Supper looks backwards to Jesus' death. It remembers and it affirms what has happened, that God could not stay away from people, that God had to come close but God also would not stay away from people's problems. He submitted himself to rejection and betrayal, to a terrible criminal justice system, to pain, to torture for us, to be with us in all things, even the worst parts of human life. We eat because something died, whether that something was a carrot or a cow. Uh, we eat because Jesus died. Jesus has provided for us. Jesus has made a way through for us. But communion also looks forwards. Jesus' dinner party looks forward to the eternal life that we will have in the new heavens and the new earth when everything is made right as Jesus intended for it to be. Jesus died alone but he rose in community. And one of the main metaphors we see throughout Scripture of what's going to happen when Jesus comes back is that he's going to throw a feast for us. Isaiah says, as he prophesies um, about the final restoration, in Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat, there he will remove the cloud of gloom and he will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his people. The Lord has spoken and in that day the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Cheers. Jesus is preparing the best for us. And communion is also, of course, communal. The first Christian communion included Judas. So we kind of have to include everybody. Now, it did not work out so well for Judas. Judas should have excluded himself. The wrong things in communion are, are here usually. But Jesus included Judas. In general, as a good rule of thumb, community is just how it works in the kingdom of God. Our Father has many kids. Jesus has plenty of friends. And the Holy Spirit talks to more than just me. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, I don't think we see any indication in Scripture that this is just like a three-second eating and drinking. What we see throughout Scripture is that this is life around the table. This is coming and receiving, being in community, forgiving each other, worshiping. It's life together. And remembrance is not like a passing thought that comes into you, you think about it. Remembrance is a realization that changes everything. It's an actualized awareness of who Jesus is and what he does that 
remembers and like restores us. Communion actualizes the past and the future together here and now. If one day we will all bow before the throne together, then today we must all gather at the table together. Amen? The communion table is a big table. It stretches from Milford Hopkinton through to Boston, Worcester. Churches all throughout Massachusetts are doing the same thing today throughout the globe with our friends in Spain. Family in Brazil. Rini, Nissi, uh, Shirley, your families are doing this in different continents, receiving this same bread and this same cup. This is the same communion table that our forefathers have gathered around St. Augustine, Martin Luther, Mother Teresa, Rosa Parks, all have table fellowship with us. It's the same communion table that our grandparents, that our mother and fathers have received from. This is the same table that God told our parents with two new kids in a station wagon with no seat belts in it, that he would take care of them, despite the Vietnam War, despite this, despite all. It's the same table that we are gathered around and told, God will provide. Picture for a minute with me, if you will, a really long table, like one of those fancy Vogue magazine tables in a really expensive wedding that just stretches real long. Like way over there is Billy Graham. And he smiles and he nods at you. Because that's what you do when you're seated at the same table with someone. You acknowledge them, you smile, you nod. And over there is John Wimber. Got the Ugandan martyrs, Oscar Romero, same table, same meal. And then on the other side, there are lots of empty seats. And those are open for everyone who's going to come because it's a big table. But at the head of the table is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, come to me, everyone who is hungry and thirsty, and I will refresh you. Those the Lord brings to me, I will never turn away. What I have to give is real food and real drink. Friends, we're going to pray, and then we're going to take communion together. And as we pray, I want us to really pray. We're going to pray for those who aren't here yet. And we're going to pray together for all of those who have taken communion with us throughout the years. We are part of a much, much bigger family and a much, much bigger table. 